Well, welcome today to all of our campuses, all of our network churches. How many of you are ready for another tough one? All right. A few of you. Thank you. Let's do it. If you are uh, new with us, uh, the series is called Practical Atheist. If you're taking notes, what is a practical atheist? A practical atheist is someone who believes in God but lives as if he does not exist. According to a recent Gallup poll, some 94% of Americans believe in God or some universal spirit, but 94% of Americans do not live as if he exists. This week uh, may be the most difficult one for some to handle. And I want to encourage you, don't shake it. Don't glaze over. Don't fight against what God wants to say to you. If it's painful, take it. Internalize it. Uh, face the hypocrisy in your life as I am in my own life and let God speak to you. Uh, We'll do it this way. I've got a a $10 bill on the back of it. It says, in God we trust. I'm glad that it says that, but in reality for many of us, it's simply not true. Week number one, I believe in God, but I don't really fear him. Week number two, I believe in God, but I don't want to go overboard. Instead, I end up lukewarm. Week number three, I believe in God, but I often trust in money. Very few people would actually say that is true, but the way we live our lives represents what is really true to us, and many of us claim belief in God, and yet we trust, serve, worship, and believe in money. The challenge is Jesus said this. In Luke 12, 34, he said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Many of us, we do not truly treasure God. We treasure money and the things of this world more than we do the things of God. Our heart is here, and because of that, our heart is not with God as much as it is in the things of this world because many of us are practical atheists. We believe in God, but we trust in money. How do we trust in money? Two ways if you're taking notes. The first is this. We trust money to provide happiness. Now, most of us wouldn't say, I trust money for happiness. We wouldn't say that. In fact, let me just try this. All of our campuses, if you guys could participate. How many of you would say that you agree that money does not buy happiness? How many of you say, I agree money does not buy happiness? Now, be honest. How many of you would say a little bit more money would actually help you? How many of you would say, okay, see? Now, now, now look at the hypocrisy. I mean, we claim to believe that money does not buy happiness, but when you're honest, almost everyone would say, but a little bit more would help because we believe in God, but we trust money to make us happy or the things that it buys. We, we don't want to admit that, but the way we live says it to be true. In fact, if you look at most people in our country today, most people are drowning in financial debt. Why? Now, there are some exceptions. There are some who had extreme medical problems and, and the bills were astronomical or you know, some lady may be married to some loser jerk of a guy who left you chasing some skirt and left you with four kids and you're working for $8 an hour and you just can't make it. I I know there are exceptions, but the vast majority of the people in our culture today are grossly drowning in debt. Why? Because they believe that the things this buy will make, this will make us happy. The house that we couldn't afford, the car that we couldn't afford, the clothing we could, the, the vacation, because people are in debt Face it, own it, admit to it because you believe that what this buys will make you happy. We believe in God, but our actions say we trust in this for happiness. Second way we trust in money is we believe in God, but we trust money to provide security. If you are a practical atheist and if this is a problem for you, then you have a functional savior, and your functional savior is this. If I'm perhaps a little passionate about this, it's because this is a major weak spot for me. For me, it's not about buying the fancy stuff as much as it is this helps me feel secure. In fact, when I look at my own life, here's basically what I've done, and this is so hard to admit, but this is true. Basically, my goal in life has been to design my life so I really don't need God, okay? You say, what do you mean? Pay off everything so I don't have debt, get enough of these and get all the insurance. So basically, no matter what happens, I'm financially secure. 
And for many, that's simply a goal. I believe in God, but I trust in this. And you say, well, that's not me. No, just look at your response to the struggling economy. What happens? Hoo, 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 hoo. I mean, it, like it's the worst thing that could ever, ever happen because what's happening is you claim belief in God, but when someone jacks with this, oh, by golly, that gets your attention, doesn't it? Why? Because it's a functional savior. Don't mess with the thing that makes me feel safe, secure, and happy. Believe in God, but trust in this. Well, why is this such an issue? If you're taking notes, because for so many of us, the number one competitor for your heart is money. For so many, that's why scripture is so direct. First Timothy 6.10, for the love of what? Everybody, for the love of what? For the love of? Money, what is it? It is a what? It is a root of all evils. Is money evil? No, 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 not at all. Is the things that money buy evil? Nope. What is evil? The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered away from their faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. The words of Jesus, Luke 16, 13, no servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. Help me out, all of our campuses. You cannot serve both what? You cannot serve both God and you can't serve them both. Notice Jesus didn't say you can't serve both God and yourself. Can't serve both God and power. Can't serve both God and sex. What did he say? You can't serve both God and? Why did he say that? Because he knew for so many of us, the number one competitor for our hearts would be money. Here's the deal. Why is it a competitor? Because it's a false god. It's an idol. It wants to be number one. Um, god wants us to worship and to serve and to love him. And it's okay if we use money, it's okay. Use it. Use it. It's neutral. It's not. Worship, love, and serve God. Use money. But what happens is, without even knowing it, we tend to worship, serve, and love money and use God. God, get me more of this. God, I, I, yeah, I want, I want to believe in you, but man, I want everything that this provides. Yeah, I'll, I'll nod at you, but oh, 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 this is important to me. I woke up today just feeling nauseous because this is not fun to preach. I mean, I, I, I don't go, oh, great. <laughs> you know, it's so painful. And it, it, it hurts me in such a good way because I'm dealing with deep heart issues in my own life. I'm talking deep. I mean deep. This whole security thing, I mean it goes deep. Don't, I beg you, don't glaze over. I mean, I can already see some of you, I can see it in your eyes. You just, you're checking out because you can't even go there. Go there. Force yourself. Deal with it. Don't shake it. Don't shake it. For the sake of the kingdom of God in your own soul, don't shake it. Face it. Let it hurt. Let it, let it wreck you. I mean, it's just, it's eating me alive to see just how much, and I hate to say it, I believe, but I trust. Don't shake it. Let it speak to you. Let's do this. Um, we're going to look at two encounters with Jesus, two rich guys who run into Jesus, and maybe you'll see yourself in these stories. The first guy is a very intelligent, well-educated, sharp, rich, young guy who's on the upswing. He's a rich, young ruler. In Matthew 19, he encounters Jesus, and he wants to know, what do I need to do to be saved? What, what do I need to do to have eternal life? And Jesus responds to him very directly. It's the only time Jesus ever says this to anyone, and he answers this rich guy and says, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Now, why did Jesus say that to this particular guy. Very likely because he was a practical atheist in this area of his life. He believed in God. He wanted to know what it takes to be right with God, but he trusted and served in his great wealth. And basically Jesus was saying, there is something that's more important in your life than God. Which one are you gonna choose? And here's his response. Verse 22, when the young man heard this, he went away sad. Why was he sad? Because he had what? Because he had 
a lot of these, okay? And they were more important to him than God. Now, you may say, well, I would never do that. And I would say, most of us do that every single day of our lives. Every day. Every day. We choose the things of this world over the things of the kingdom of God. I mean, most of you will watch more DVR shows today than you'll spend in prayer all week long. Deal with it. Honestly, many of you will spend more on coffee annually than you will give to kingdom causes. Did you know the average American spends six hours a week shopping and only 40 minutes a week playing with their kids? Why? Own it. Because this consumes us. What do you wake up thinking about? Hey, how can I give more, be more generous, be more of a kingdom player? Or do you wake up thinking about, how am I gonna pay the bills and how am I gonna get more? And oh, I'm so stressed financially. Who's number one? The rich guy said, I'm sorry, I want Jesus, but I'm not willing to give my stuff up to get it. That's why Jesus continued the conversation, and it's a painful one. He said to his disciples, you guys gotta understand, it's really hard for rich folk to get saved. And so when we hear that story, we go, well, yeah, it's hard for them, but we don't recognize basically when he's saying that, he's saying it to us because we have to own just how rich we are. And most of you go, no, I'm not rich, there's really rich people, no. When you recognize that around 60% of the world lives on less than $2 a day, you, when, you, when you look at it from a global perspective, people look at us and go, holy cow, you got a toilet that flushes. I mean, you, know, you laugh, you, that, that, you're rich. I mean, you've got transportation that, that you know, you got a vehicle that puts you in the top 3%. You've got a heater and an air conditioner and water that runs through your house. I mean, that's mega filthy rich. And Jesus says, you are at such an extreme disadvantage spiritually because it's so hard for the rich. It's so hard for them to put God first because they've got so many other things. You, you, you've never, very few of you have ever had the blessing of praying, Father, give me today my daily bread. And then watched as God miraculously provided and proved himself again because most of us, we've got enough bread in the cupboard to last all week long. We're at a tremendous spiritual disadvantage. And Jesus said, it's so hard for people like us to get it right. There's another rich guy who encountered Jesus. Only this guy wasn't nearly as moral. This guy had really bad morals. He was uh, one of the most despised people of the day. He was uh, a little bitty guy, short guy, had a short guy complex named Zacchaeus, and he was a tax collector, which means basically he had the license to steal. In that day, what he could do is say, okay, you owe the government $50, but I'm gonna tell you you owe 70, and then I'm gonna give them 50 and keep 20 for myself. And that's what he could do. He had license to do that, and so he was basically a legal criminal and everybody hated him. Well, when Jesus came to town, he wanted to meet Jesus, but he was a short guy, so he couldn't see it, so he climbed up in a tree because he was a wee little man, a wee little man was he, you see, okay? And so Jesus came in and Jesus wanted to talk to him and Jesus said, can I come over to your house for dinner? And the guy saw who Jesus was and it changed everything. Here's what he did. When he recognized who Jesus was, verse 8 of Luke 19, Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give how much? He said, I give half. I give half of my possession to the poor. If I cheated anyone out of anything, I'll do what? I'll pay it back how many times? Four times. In other words, Jesus, I've seen you, and all of a sudden, all these things that they were so important to me, and just yesterday, they were. I was all about the bling, the money, the image, the, the security. I was all about that. But wow, Jesus, I see you now. That stuff doesn't hold me anymore. And so, everything I have, half, I give to you. What, and then what did Jesus say? If you read on, Jesus said, today, salvation has come to your home. Now, salvation did not come because he gave half. He gave half because salvation came to his home. And there's a difference. Because he truly saw Jesus and truly recognized that the things of this world do not last and truly recognized that Jesus is the true Savior and King and Lord, all of a sudden this stuff didn't hold him like it once did. 
See, that's my story. And I'll tell you right now, when I, when I am far from God, and some of you could go, but you're a preacher, how would that happen? I am a regular guy, and I'm telling you what, it happens. My heart drifts away from God. And I get, and when, when I'm far from God, I'll be on, the things of this world, they look shiny, fun, and they're appealing to me. So, I mean, that's the way it is. When I'm far from God, it all looks appealing to me. When I'm close to him, the things of the world don't look so appealing. Why? Because he's enough. Doesn't mean that don't have the things, but they don't have me. If you find that you're still consumed with more and bigger and better and faster, I would say to you very lovingly and very respectfully, it's probably because you're not walking real close to God right now. Don't shake that. Don't argue. Deal with the reality that if you love the things of this world more than you do him, it's because you don't really know him. I mean, feel it. Grieve it. Ache, ache deeply for whatever truth you hear in, in that in your life. That if you're far from him, man, I'm telling you what, it looks good. But when you're close to him, it loses its power. I'll, I'll show you a couple of examples of how this happens. Um, when you fall in love with Jesus, you will fear God because you'll know who he is. When you fall in love with Jesus, you, you can't be lukewarm because you know who he is. And, and, and all of a sudden, these things, they loosen their grip. Two, two things will happen. Many things will happen. Here's two. When you fall in love with Jesus, number one, you become strangely content. I say strangely because people won't understand it because most people aren't content. You're different. You're content. You're satisfied. 1 Timothy 6, 17, Paul said, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope where? Nor to put their hope in what? In, in wealth. Why? Because it's so what? What is it? It's so uncertain. But instead to put your hope where? To put your hope, don't put your hope in wealth, but put your hope in God. Who does what? God what? God richly provides us with how much? Everything we need for our enjoyment. Let me tell you this. Pursue everything you can that this buys, and you will not be fulfilled. Try it. Many of you are. Do it. Buy everything you can. Make more. Sacrifice your family on the altar of financial success. Make more. Get to the end of your life and ask yourself, did this buy true fulfillment? And I guarantee you your answer will be no. Why? Because it's only found here. It's only found here. And yet even though... Those of you who are believers may say that, the way we practically live is, I believe in God, but I trust in this. No, no. When I trust in God, he is the one who richly provides everything for our enjoyment. He is the one who brings what matters, and when he brings what matters, all of a sudden the things of this world don't hold us like they did. I mean, this is, this is my story, and, and, and you know, many of you have commented, well, Craig, I can tell over the last three years, God's doing something to you. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and I hope he is for you too. I mean, how can you not get to know him and let him just mess you up in the best sort of way? And, and, and here's the deal. I mean, I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit this. I'm 40 years old, and for the most part, I've spent 40 years accumulating. Started out with a small home, and then closets got small, so we got a bigger one. He used to have a small car, bigger car, nicer this. Ni and, and I've spent 40 years. Well, the, God's just been wrecking us in my family. It's just going all through us. And we've grown so close to God this year, I mean dangerously close to where it's making some of you uncomfortable. You don't want to come back because you don't want to hear this kind of stuff. I mean, I understand. And, we, and finally, Amy and I just looked around and we just said, enough. I mean, enough. If we can't be happy with all this stuff, then there is something sick and deeply wrong with us. Enough. And the, the cool thing was, is it was a, a very easy thing because it's like, God is so much, why in the world would we be pursuing all this other stuff? Enough. It's a beautiful thing. I mean, it just, it just sets, sets us free. Enough. When you, when you fall in love with Jesus, when you get close to him, you become strangely content. The second thing, what I'm about to tell you, some of you are going to resist, and no one's going to go, oh, well, I'm so glad you're preaching. It, 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 this, this should be one of the most exciting things to us, and sadly it's not. The second thing is this, when you, when you fall radically in love with Jesus, you become irrationally generous. 
You, you become irrationally generous. You, you, the things of the world don't hold you, and you see what you have as a great responsibility, and you become just fanatically, irrationally generous. Uh, and, and the reality is, in our country, people aren't. Let, let me talk to you just about people's giving to the church. Um, 21% of consistent U.S. churchgoers don't give anything to their church. Almost one in four give nothing. That's many of you, okay? O- own that for a minute. Just own, own that for a minute. That's many of you. Why don't you? Because this is your God. Okay? 71% give less than 2%. Why? I believe with everything in me, I, I believe that the tithe is biblical, that the first 10% is holy unto the Lord God, that it is his, and it is my joy to return it to him, and it does so much. First of all, he said, test me in this. See if I won't be faithful. It's the only place I get to test God. He tests me all the time. I get to test God and see his faithfulness. But here's the deal. When we first started tithing, man, it was the biggest, scariest thing. And people tell me all the time, you mean to tell me I'm supposed to give 10% to God through my church? You know what that's gonna do? I'm gonna have to change my life. I mean, think about this. Think about it. I'm gonna have to change my lifestyle for God? Yes. Yes. Do you see how beautiful that is? Well, I wanna change my lifestyle for God. Yeah, that's beautiful. It, it forces me to reprioritize my life, to say, guess what? I'm not going to serve this, and I'm not going to do this because I'm going to put God first. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And then it forces me to have some faith, and God comes through. But the reality is, most of us, we serve leftovers to a holy God. We're not the first people to do this. It happened in the Old Testament. God said, bring your best lambs to sacrifice. And these guys, they were like us, like, okay, my, you're not getting my best one because this one is perfect. I mean, look at them, beautiful. This one will bring some money at the market, but I got this other one, this kind of scraggly looking one with, you know, no hair grows back on, near the butt and is you know, blind and, you know, that's an ugly. Nobody's gonna pay me money for that one. I'll give that one to God, Okay. I give that one to God. I give my leftovers to God. Here's what God said to that attitude. Malachi 1.8, he said this. He said, when you bring your blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice crippled or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? We arrange our life around God and we return the tithe to him joyfully and worshipfully. And then we like to give offerings and we like to give and give and give and give and give and give. But in reality, in our country, our philosophy basically is I'll give if it doesn't impinge my standard of giving. I'll give if I don't have to feel it. I'll I'll give as long as it doesn't affect what I want to do. I'll I'll, I'll give as long as I've got enough of these, but I'm not going to give in such a way that I really have to have faith here. Okay? David, I like his philosophy in the Old Testament, 2 Samuel 24, 24, when a guy said, hey, there's a um, sacrifice coming up, I'll give you some oxen, and you can sacrifice them. He said, no, I insist on paying for it. I will not sacrifice anything to the Lord my God. I won't sacrifice any burnt offerings to him that what? Cost me nothing. I want to feel it. I want to feel it. Here, here's, I'll just, just be real open about where our family is. Um, when I was 19, I started buying rental properties. When I was 28, I paid off our house. Uh, we've always lived beneath our means. We didn't buy uh, new clothes for years. I mean, not, we bought, our cars were over 10 years old. We lived beneath our means. We've made investments. We've done well. I've written four books. Two of them did well. We've got margin, okay? I know some people say we don't want our preachers to be blessed. We've got margin. Some would say we were faithful with a little bit and God gave us more, okay? So, you know, if you don't like that, sorry. Well, because we've got margin, we're able to give pretty big. Tithe, 10%. Big, another percentage to campus development, big percentage to missions, big percentage to feed children, seven different ministries we gladly support. Amy's got her own deal, and we're able to give. But because we've been faithful, we're able to give without really feeling it a lot of times. 
And we started meeting this year and pr- praying and said, you know what, we want to feel it. We want to give something up, and we, we want the joy of sacrificing something. So we've just started really small. Amy, uh, she's so simple, doesn't want anything. She loves flowers. And so when we were getting out of debt, no flowers. Don't you ever think about it? There's no flower going in our yard. That's frivolous. Whatever. When we got out of debt, I said, I'll get you flowers every year. And so every year we plant little flowers, and she loves them. She said this year, I don't want to do flowers. I'm like, well, but you love flowers. She said, no. I figured out how much we spend on flowers. What I'd like to do this year is I'd like to not do flowers so we can give that. I said, I'm all in. That's beautiful. We sat down with our kids, and I don't recommend this for any of you uh, necessarily because this is just where we are. I'm just, I'm just telling you. This is where, where God has us. We sat down with our kids and said, let's do Christmas a little differently this year. How about if you all will give you one very modest gift, very modest gift, and um, we're not going to exchange any other gifts. We're going to invite our family. Not to, basically, we're not going to do Christmas this year. And what we're going to do is take the money we were going to spend on Christmas and we're going to give it to this orphanage that we all love and we're praying for. And all six of my kids voted unanimously, absolutely, Daddy. We feel like that would honor God. And that's, that's important to us. That's where we are, okay, because we, we want to. I have to sacrifice something because I haven't for so much of my life. So you may say, well, great, you know, I'm happy for you and stuff. You need to understand this is such a struggle for me because for me, I'm telling you, it's so deep, this represents security, okay? Um, I, uh, Amy has her own giving budget because she's, she just, she'd give it all away, so I have to give her a budget so that we can eat because she'd give it all away. And I give her her own budget because I don't like the way she gives because I give systematically and she gives emotionally. So like, she'll see some guy with nothing and she'll give him all this stuff. I'm like, look, that guy doesn't deserve anything. He's a lazy bum. He's got his butt on his sofa. He needs to get up and get a job. And so that's my deal. And then she's like, oh, give to him. And so I give her her own so I can't stop her from doing what God puts on her heart. Well, um, every year for her birthday, we don't give presents to each other. And she asks for her birthday an increase in her giving budget. That's what she gets every year. So each year she negotiates for more. Well, this year I felt God really speaking to my heart to take it from here to here. Didn't tell her this. And I was looking at it, and I said, no, I'm not going to do that because that's too much. I can't. And, I, and I, I mean, I just was in a state of panic because I felt like this is what God was asking me to do. And I, I basically said, God, that would take faith. I would have to sacrifice, and then I would have to trust you for the future. I can't do that. And God said, that's exactly why I want you to do that, you see. And, I mean, it, it represents security. I'm thinking six kids, college, cars, braces. I mean, braces. Braces. We used to do braces one time. They have pre braces now. Do you know that? They're the braces before the braces. Okay. So this, re- so this represents security to me. And Amy's birthday came. It was on a Thursday. And at our house, birthday goes all week long. That's just how we do it. And Sunday, it was over. The big, all the parties were over. And so it was Sunday night at 11 30. And I was in bed, still arguing with God. And I finally got out of my bed. I went in and I wrote a symbolic check and I came back in and said, here is your giving budget. And she looked at it and she's like, and it was like, it was this holy moment. The problem is we're both old now and we're too tired to make out and celebrate. It's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> five years ago, the boom, baby, you know, but it was like, you know, and, uh, and, and we cried and prayed and fell asleep and uh, I, <laughs> that's the truth, this is where we live. And so I, um, I woke up and I cannot tell you, I cannot tell you how right it feels because with everything in me by faith, I am, I am fighting against the practical atheism of where I believe in God, but I trust in this. And um, I just, I pray, I don't, I don't want to preach this in such a way that makes anyone feel guilty for what they have. God, God blesses people. But when, I want you to confront wherever you're putting faith in this, because this is a false God, it is an idol, and it does not last. And I beg you not to shake it, but to deal with whatever whatever hypocrisy is in your life and be honest before God. And I pray that he takes this deep and that you cannot be the same because either he is king of kings and lord of all, or he's nothing. And uh, I believe he, he asked for all of our lives. God, would you, um, would you just continue to stir our little church and just, um, just wreck us, God, in the best sort of way? As you're praying today at all of our campuses, um, 
what I want you to do is I'm, I'm going to challenge you to be honest enough to face the, um, the hypocrisy in your life. And, and it's interesting to me, the, uh, the low response this weekend, it just, it, what it tells me is that um, there's spiritual walls blocking from hearing truth because I don't know, I don't know anybody personally that doesn't struggle with this. I really don't. And I think it, bre- it breaks my heart to know that someone could um, be under God's word and then just walk out unchanged. Um, what I'm, I'm asking you guys to be involved in life groups because this is, this is where we really hashed it out. I mean, we cried and um, prayed through our life group last week. We couldn't even talk. All we could do is just cry and pray because we realized how lukewarm we are. I don't know what's going to happen this week because um, we need such deep cleansing and healing in this area. Those of you who would say, that's me, I don't like it, I don't want to admit it, but this is an issue and God is speaking to me and I'm going to ask him to continue and I'm going to ask him to gut me. I don't want to be a practical atheist. I don't want to claim belief in him but trust in something else. I want him to be Lord of everything. I want to be so close to him that things of this world lose their power on me. I want to be full on. I want to be Zacchaeus. I want to be the one who says, it, nothing's keeping me from you, Jesus. If that's you, would you lift up your hands right now? Just lift them up all over the place. Just a ton of you. God, I pray that in this simple act of faith that you would, that you would just confirm their request and God, you would answer it. I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would continue to bless us with this message and, and crush us with it. I pray, God, that it would haunt us and follow us. God, I, I pray that weeks from now and months from now, we continue to wrestle with, with your word and with our lives. And, and God, that we would truly have an open hand to you. God, make us strangely content, not with the things of your kingdom, but with the things of this world. God, make us irrationally generous. God, I pray that we would have the joy of knowing what it's like to serve you full of faith, full of faith, that our lives would truly make a difference in this world. As you, as you keep praying today at all of our campuses, I called money a functional savior. Many of you, you've got other functional saviors. Um, 94% of our country says they believe in God or some type of universal spirit. I guarantee you, 94% are not heaven bound. They're, they're, They're not. What does it take to be saved? What does it take to be right with God? Well, uh, the rich young ruler, he had something in his life that was bigger than God. It was his things. Maybe that's truly the Lord of your life. Some people think, well, if I work really hard, you know, and try to be good, then that'll be enough. Let me tell you right now, you're a filthy sinner before a holy God, and so am I. And there is no way you can work your way to him. You cannot. Others of you think, well, I'm better than so-and-so, so that must be okay, or I'm trying kind of hard, or, or, you know, I believe in God. Listen, the demons, they believe in God, and they shudder. They're smart enough to shudder. Most people today believe in God and don't even shudder at all. What, what, what's the story of God? Here's the good news. Because we're so messed up and so far from a holy God, he sent his son to become one of us, his son Jesus, who was born without sin and lived the perfect life. And he said, you know what? You want to follow me? You've got to d- deny yourself. It can no longer be about you. Jesus took our sin upon him and he died on a cross and he rose again and now he says, anyone who calls on my name, anyone who calls on my name, surrenders their life wholly to me will be saved. All of the sin, the filth, the guilt, it will be forgiven and you'll be transformed. And there are those of you here, you're recognizing your need for Jesus. It's hard, you gotta understand it's hard for the rich people, that's us, because we, we don't know how needy we really are. And you're gonna recognize right now you're spiritually bankrupt and you need a savior. Turn from your sin, turn toward Jesus, grieve deeply for your sin, call on his name. Ask him not just to forgive you, that is so selfish. Ask him to be first, the Lord of your life, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, all of our campuses, that's you today, call on his name. Jesus, take my whole life, I give it to you. Would you be the Savior, the Lord of my life? Would you lift your hands high right now? Lift them up and just leave them up, and I want to acknowledge and meet you eye to eye. Right back here in this section, right here, sir, God bless you, ma'am, right here, right back over here on this side. Others of you, way back there toward the back, God bless you as well. Others who would say, yes, that's me, I, I call on his name. Right back over here on this side, God bless you as well. Others of you, call on his name, Jesus save me. Both of you right back over here and right back over here as well, call on his name over here around this corner. Welcome into the family of God. Others of you who would say, that's my prayer right back there. I see you. God sees you. Others of you, call on his name, Jesus first, Savior, Lord, I surrender to you. Others of you, you recognize right back over there saying, yes, I give my whole life to you. Would you all pray with those around you? Just pray, pray aloud. Pray, Heavenly Father, take my whole life. I repent 
of everything I put ahead of you. I repent of my sins. Forgive me. Change me. Save me. Fill me with your spirit so I could follow you. Give me new life, and I give you mine. All of it. I am now a disciple of Jesus. Take my life. Use it for your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Life Church, would you worship God? Would you praise him? Would you honor his name and welcome those today?